This is the Friday, March 21st, 2014 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now is Elaine Cub. Elaine, welcome back. Thanks. One of the topics we didn't have a chance to discuss on the show, but has been on a pretty incredible rally, is the cotton market. Yep. Talk to us about that. We're up north of $90 now. Where is this headed? Yeah, well, I don't know how much legs there might still be in the old crop market. Like you say, it's a 92, I think, was the high. And you're right, this rally has been going on for a couple of weeks now. It's interesting to note in the new crop cotton, it's not that high. It's $80, but it has been trending higher. So there has been some bullishness in that, but there is also, you know, apparently the thought that there's going to be significant U.S. supply coming online before December. However... I, you know, wonder if there's not considerable legs in the new crop cotton market to come up and meet that $92 level that the old crop is simply because of that drought. You know, there's thought that the corn is going to lose acres to cotton this year um, because of the profitability. But if you have to pay enough money to irrigate your cotton acres and pump, pump that water, uh, you know, maybe your profitability does not favor that. That's true. And are we expecting to see fewer acres in cotton as more folks switch to corn and beans as well? Is that still a topic in the market? I think the expectation for the past several months was for cotton to gain acres. I think that that's probably what we're going to see in the prospective plantings report, honestly, because that's what a intention may be. But as far as profitability, I'm not sure that it's there. I think that uh, it may not happen. Might still be looking at other crops yeah. to see a little more better profit potential. All right. Now, we've got a number of questions. You're a South Dakota native. Yes, sir. And so we've got some folks from uh, South Dakota's northern brother in North Dakota, Dave in East Central North Dakota and Adam in Kindred. They're dealing with rail issues, yeah. a weakening basis. Of course, oil has been the, the main transport on the railroads up there. And basis is suffering. We saw it in Canada with the oats two yes. weeks ago. Now we're seeing basis suffering up in North Dakota. When is that going to turn back around? What does the future look like for crop producers in that neck of the woods? Well, we'd really need to get an executive from the BNSF or the UP here to answer that question. You know, they really just need to add capacity so that you're not just bottlenecked with energy trains so that you would have some capacity to be shipping that grain. And that really needs to happen in the next 10, 15 years or now would be a good time. Particularly like strategically, more and more grain is going to be headed west to the PNW to load out to Asia. So that capacity for grain on the northern shipping routes needs to happen. But it has not happened yet, obviously. And you're seeing that, obviously, in those basis bids. There's a fairly large ethanol industry in the Dakotas. However, the ethanol industry does not have to bid more for basis than what they have to compete against the rail market for. So if the rail market's not there, you know, this is basically just the situation you have to deal with. And I think one of these guys on Twitter mentioned fertilizer being another yes. problem, being uh, bottlenecked from these rail problems. So... Uh, I don't have a solution for you. It's just interesting to note the challenges, how this is not helping anybody's profitability in the northern routes. No, and, and I'm not a rail expert, and perhaps this comment will expose that, but if I've got a rail train running from oil in North Dakota down to wherever, uh, the Gulf, I imagine, wouldn't it be easy to send it back with fertilizer? Different tanks, I suppose? Uh, yeah, I you, well... Gosh, I don't know the answer to that either. I mean, but I think some fertilizer is certainly pelletized and can be on the hopper cars, so it might be a different type of train, yes. to be honest with you. But, uh, you know, at, at some degree it doesn't really matter because you've got bottlenecks on the on the rail lines themselves. Right. Right. So there's your there's your expert analysis yeah. on the fertilizer market. We don't know anything about trains. Um, but as we go forward, we've got a number of other great questions here from our, our viewers. Uh, Gail and Remsen, we were talking about winter kill in yeah. the wheat market yeah. and how that's going to have an effect. She's concerned about alfalfa and the grasses. As we look at this winter kill, are we going to lose as much alfalfa as Wisconsin and Minnesota did last year, do you think? Well, no, I think her question is coming from Iowa. So yes. that's, yep. that's interesting to note because this is still in Iowa is a drought region, like the winter kill regions for the winter wheat crop. So having a situation where 20% of the winter wheat crop is poor or very poor, we've seen that before. We've seen that in several years in the past, and yet we've still managed to produce enough wheat. The difference is that the very cold winter has created this winter kill, and that's also the situation in Iowa where you've had a dry winter, but it's been very cold. There has not been enough snow cover to protect your alfalfa or your hay um, roots. So certainly it could be a problem for individual producers or producers in this region that has had the drought or the cold through the winter, but honestly, the overall hay market I would be fairly bearish on because your northern plains, Montana, Wyoming, they actually have ample or moisture going into the spring. They're probably going to have a very large hay crop coming on, and I don't think we're going to be in a 2012 situation of a shortage of hay. 
Okay. All right. Well, that's probably reassuring news for producers who are looking out at their alfalfa fields in in Iowa and, and parts of Nebraska. Well, thinking, you know, it's kind of like the pig thing. It's not it's not great news if you are the one affected by this right. problem. But from a market perspective, it may be good news for somebody else. All right. Now we have had some questions about uh, the feeder market. We saw the feeders pull back uh, this week. What's happening there? We did see corn basically unchanged, and we saw a dollar eighty move in the feeders. You know, it's really hard to say there. Uh, again, probably just some speculative profit taking here ahead of time. But honestly, the uh, the expectation going into 2015 would be for the herd to expand, the breeding herd to expand, but we have not seen it yet. There's certainly indications that people will be holding their heifers back, but you're looking at, you know, 18 months before that has any effect on the actual supply of calves um, in, in the mix. So... For the near term, you know, there's really no expectation for a greater supply of calves coming on, and, and you're still looking at a neutral or bullish, perhaps, potential for that drop that we saw on Thursday to certainly recover and perhaps even go to fresh new highs. All right. Now, Elaine, before we let you go, you travel a lot. You see a lot of the country, and you're also going to be an international traveler before too long. As we sit here in mid-March 2014, what is your, what's the biggest story do you think going to be in agriculture as we roll through this year? Well, you know, it's really interesting to see how the markets um, did not respond to the interest rate move or the move in the dollar this week. But overall, I would say in 2014 that whatever happens to the dollar will affect the grains. And the expectation for the dollar would be to go up. We have record highs in the stock market, the general suggestion that the economy is doing well, that the chairman of the Federal Board of Reserve will raise those interest rates as the economy continues to strengthen. So these are not great news for anybody owning land or owning commodities. So that would be a sort of big, broad story, the number one thing I would say. All right. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us this weekend, Elaine. We appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. And wish you safe travels. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for continuing to submit your questions via Facebook and Twitter. Please continue to do so. Tell your friends to do so. We would love to get expert analysis right to you. So thanks for watching and have a great week.